Let's pray. Thank you, Father. We're overjoyed because of grace and the forgiveness of our sins, and it leads us, inspires us to try to live more like you. Empower us, and may these words bring strength and clarity on our path this day and forever. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. There's a new phenomenon, and we can all kind of participate like the canine creatures that are our friends, dogs. You know how they bark. It's kind of like a way to get our attention. And there's this app called Yelp. Yelp, Yelp. It's a way you can bark at people. That's generally what people do, is you can bark a complaint. Oftentimes, it's a review of how great things are, but it seems like most humans are so readily accepting of offering a complaint, particularly at restaurants, because it's really hard to please us, isn't it? We all have a certain level of expectation when we eat out. And this particular story caught my attention because this Yelper lives in Sterling, Virginia, and I used to live nearby. And this young woman, Yesha Callahan, had ordered from Yelp and Grubhub a meal she couldn't wait for from La Porchetta. She ordered a burger, some fries, and something I don't think I've ever had before, um, something called Zapoles. And apparently, they didn't come with powdered sugar on them. And so she got on Yelp because it just wasn't the best food. And I think she said it, it came a little late. And so she gave three stars. So if you don't know what Yelp is, if you have a smartphone or a computer, you can go in and log in and, and talk about the dining experience, shopping experience, whatever it was. And you can rate the experience. The more stars, the better. And I think three is just about midway, was it five stars total? So three is just above average, but not the best. And so complaining about her experience and finished the meal, noted that maybe they should put it in a paper bag next time so the zapoles aren't, aren't uh, soggy and some powdered sugar would be good. Otherwise, that was it. Nothing too drastic. Not too mean, right? Didn't complain about the driver or the staff. Just not personal, just professional. So she went to bed that night, sound asleep, and then <laughs> knock at the door. 10 p.m. This is a Sunday night. <laughs> then her phone was ringing incessant, incessantly. And then she listened to the voicemail, and the man said, Hi, this is the manager from La Porchetta. I wanted to talk with you. I'm outside your door. I wanted to talk with you about your Yelp review. <laughs> now, typically, all the time, really, it's supposed to be anonymous, so to speak. They're not supposed to know where you live. But they were so hyper about what people were saying about them on Yelp that the manager took it upon himself to come to her apartment and ring and ring and ring her phone and knock on the door. I just wanted to talk to you about your Yelp review. So you know what she did? She called the police. She said, I don't open the door for anybody past 10 p.m. So she didn't know what the purpose was, if this was a legitimate reason to be at her door or ill intent. So the police officer responded, and he said, really? The manager was there? To follow up on a Yelp review? That's ridiculous. No wonder you called us. Good thing. Don't ever answer your door like that. You know, you made a good decision. So long story short, the owner of the restaurant apologized on Yelp, you know, telling the public what's going on. We're sorry. The manager was a little too zealous. That's inappropriate. It should never happen again. Yelp responded and rescinded their delivery privileges and other rights that they have through the system to protect customers and so on. So this is an experience of where there was conflict. The young woman didn't quite like the service she received in her meal. 
So it was a conflict. She wasn't satisfied. The restaurant didn't like her rating. So the manager came to try and deal with the conflict. And I don't know about you, but sometimes for me, when I try to handle conflict, sometimes it gets worse. But that doesn't mean we should cease trying to resolve conflict in a healthy way. We should always continue to be introspective, to realize our environment, and if we sense that there's something mistaken, disagreement of various levels, that we make every effort to maintain peace, Ephesians 4.3. And you know what happens? I agonize over this. I'm, I try to be more thoughtful, and I'm sure you are too, because when it gets personal, when it's among friends and family or God's reputation as God's ambassadors, that's what a Christian is. We're his ambassadors. We're taking on his name. So people are looking at us to see how we behave, not because it's righteousness by works, but it's because we are saved and we want to be the best example of Jesus we can be. And so when there's conflict, I agonize over what to say, when to say it. What did I do to instigate this? How can I help alleviate this? What can I change about myself? And so on. And I sense you do the same thing because you care deeply about people that you affect and how you affect people. Amen? Amen. From close friends and family to colleagues to strangers on the street. And so that's why we're going through this series, one of many Bible apps in, in Scripture, applications. These are relationship applications that we're going through. Jesus' instructions are clear about conflict resolution. Five principal steps in Matthew 18. Overlook minor offenses. Talk in private. Take one or two others along if that doesn't work. Tell it to the church to get accountability. This person has a problem. We can be there to help them through their struggles. We can hold them accountable. And if they resist all help, then we treat as a non-believer because... Again, as ambassadors, a Christian can't go around professing that it's okay to cause arguments everywhere and be a toxic person all the time. And so we deal with this at first personally, overlook an offense. If not, if it can't be overlooked, try to aim towards reconciliation through negotiation. And if that doesn't work, then we need assistance through mediation, arbitration, and accountability where you bring one or two others along, keeping the circle as small as possible. So that gossip doesn't follow. So that others don't learn about the issue if it's not a public conflict. Committees, groups working together, that type of conflict usually, usually isn't as personal. It's a conflict over policy or direction or movement in an organization or among families planning where you're going to go on vacation or the family reunion and there's a little disagreement of whether it should be at a hotel or at a park or at someone's house, you know, those things aren't generally uh, contained so well, and it's public information, and it's not so hurtful. But when it becomes a sensitive nature, when it's a personal issue, essentially and ideally, these techniques are most helpful in containing the trouble and not exacerbating the issue. And so as we move forward this morning... Let's turn back to Romans chapter 12. Look at this in a language we understand in verse 17 and 18. Don't pay back anyone for their evil actions with evil actions. So don't do what? Don't do eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth in an evil way. Don't pay back evil for evil, but show respect for what everyone else believes is good. Interesting. This is talking about culture, isn't it? There's some cultures that what we're doing right now is not good. We've spent way too much money on our fabric that we adorn ourselves with. There's some cultures where we are way overdressed. So how do you do outreach to someone like that? I remember when my, my uh, dad and stepmother w took a journey across the United States and they had just retired, and they had some travel money, and my stepmother is part Native American Indian, and they stopped off to, to speak with some local Native Americans in this small town, and they wouldn't even talk to them. Couldn't even identify, the, the Indians couldn't identify with them because the car they were driving was too new. 
totally inappropriate in that culture. So in other words, be aware of what everyone else believes. If possible, to the best of your ability, live at peace with all people. Now, it's impossible to live at peace with everyone, right? But this is the ideal. This is the benchmark that Jesus lived, didn't even succeed in this. He didn't sin, but were people upset at him? Yes. So he didn't diminish his principles. He lived by principles and didn't break any laws, but sometimes he had to speak the truth, and he was thoughtful and prayerful about how he did it. It caused conflict at times, but he did his best to navigate it. That's why sometimes he said, don't tell them who healed you. They'll drive me out of town too soon. I still have some work to do. See, that's an example of him doing his best, if at all possible, to live at peace. But the leaders in the town and others wouldn't like it, so he said, keep this a secret. Other times he said, tell it. Why didn't you tell them who did this and so on? Romans 12, 17 through 18. So from the passage today, we draw this series to a conclusion in peacemaking with the four G's of peacemaking. Instead of gossip, we look at the four G's of peacemaking because gossip doesn't create peace, does it? No, you all know that 100%. You're already doing great on the exam. The first G is glorify God. That's what Romans 12 is saying. We make every effort to maintain peace from Ephesians 4. Couple of that with all these other passages. Ideally and principally and even as a command, God is saying to glorify God in all we do. Amen? That's why we agonize over how to approach someone who we feel needs help or who is reaching out for help and we don't want to turn them off and so on. If we're the dedicated the duly called leader or teacher or caregiver, a parent, a grandparent, or so on. We want to do it in a way that glorifies God and so on. James chapter 3, turn there with me. In verses 17 and 18, James writes, What of the wisdom from above? What about this? He's saying, first, it is pure, and then peaceful, and gentle, obedient, filled with mercy and good actions, fair and genuine. Those who make peace sow the seeds of justice by their peaceful acts. He is saying here that there is wisdom from heaven. And what is this wisdom? When we ask for the Holy Spirit to lead us, when we agonize how to deal with conflict from all levels of severity, what do we get? The wisdom we're going to get is about being pure. It's about being peaceful. The guidance is about being gentle and obedient at the same time. Being filled with mercy and good actions while being fair and genuine all at the same time so that we're sowing seeds of peace and not discord. Amen? Isn't this a feel-good passage? It is because not only is it clear guidance, it's also a promise that this wisdom from heaven, when we pray before and after endearing any conversation, any committee meeting, any planning session, any phone call, any text message, any social media post, any letter we write, any story we share, we will be able to get better at being like this. Amen? And this is about glorifying who? God. In other words, we put ourselves on the back burner. It takes humility to glorify God sometimes because we fail, many times because we fail in comparison to Him. His good nature, His example. We don't live up to it, but we try, and that's the purpose, that's the point. In Colossians, we get more about this glorifying God, chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. Therefore, if you were raised with Christ, look, For the things that are above, look for these things which are above where Christ is sitting at God's right side. Think about the things above and not things on earth. You died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ who is your life is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. In other words... 
Someday when you experience the greatest conflict in your life and you realize that all the conflict we complained about in the past was easy, easy peasy, or when your first conflict in your life comes up, some honeymoon uh, uh, marital bliss has turned now into your first marital dispute or on the work argument or, or classroom discussion gone wrong or church committee meeting gone off the rails. If that ever happens to you, how do we glorify God? Do we look at the person and the infraction? Do I look at my own mistake and beat myself down and, and feel guilty and ashamed and run away in fear, never wanting to come back and deal with it? Fight or flight, I'd rather flight. To glorify God, this passage is also coupling together by telling us where do we look? At the problem? No, we look at God. We look at Jesus. We look at him, the victorious lamb, the resurrected Lord and Savior. And when we look to him, what do we see? We see the power that he promises to give us to help us through this. As we think about these things above, I mean, think about it. Jesus has solved all our problems. The future is promised to be perfect. And right now can be troubling, and he will help us through it. That's what comes to my mind when I think of the cross. We have to pick up our cross and follow him. It's going to be painful, but what happens at the end of the road? There's a banquet. There's eternal life. There's reconnection with everyone we've loved that we miss now because they're in the grave. There's no more conflict in heaven and on the new earth. Amen? No more arguments. I'm not deserving of Jesus' grace, but he gives it to me anyway. That helps me feel better when I make a mistake. Does it you? See, looking to Christ in our conflict at that moment. I mean, if we even have to... Write this on your hand like a phylactery or something. Have it in your, in your phone, in your notes. Have it on a piece of paper, on your refrigerator, wherever you need it to remind yourself if you need the reminder. If it's not already burned in your brain to think about Jesus. And so in glorifying God, it can keep us from going down this road. Let me share another case study. This young man, a salesperson, works with my mother-in-law who works for a very famous department store where the rich and famous shop. This suit is probably less than $100 in value, but with the right name would sell for $5,000 at her store. People spending $150,000 on a few items of clothes and so on. And so this salesperson was complaining because this rich and famous customer was annoying him, wasn't taking his advice on the new wardrobe, was returning items. And in that world, in that sales environment, you get commission on your sales, and if someone returns something later, then they dock your pay to recuperate that commission. And if that happens a lot, you get annoyed if you're the salesperson. Well, the salesperson began to complain about this customer. Oh, it's so-and-so, calling names, all of this behavior, probably going to return the items. Can't believe it. So wealthy, but yet so picky. And this text message went to the customer instead of a friend who was a co-worker. Oh, so you know what the customer did forwarded the text to the general manager of the store. And then the general manager sent a text to the employee, come to my office. The employee was immediately terminated. That was a conflict that began by not dealing with the conflict, right? This employee, the salesperson, began to complain, tried to complain to a co-worker, to a friend. And because he was already communicating with the customer via text and all this, he hit the wrong text trail. He wasn't dealing with the conflict. He was just venting. 
So imagine now this customer comes in, the salesperson's not there, this is before the text went to the wrong place. The word gets around that this customer's hard to deal with. But perhaps the customer isn't hard to deal with, perhaps the salesperson was abrasive off on the wrong track, impatient. And so the customer, you know the, the old saying, customer's always right? Maybe the salesperson was rubbing the customer the wrong way, and that's why it seemed like this salesperson always had a reason to complain about the customer, but really, if the salesperson is not paying attention, is wrong, and so on, then the customer is going to retaliate in an inappropriate way, perhaps, too. Okay, I'll just buy it and, re and return it later, just to get the person to quit nagging me that I should buy it. So, in other words, this conflict wasn't being resolved over personalities and opinions and so on, and it went the wrong direction, and the person got terminated, when if they had been glorifying their company, their position as a salesperson, letting the customer always have his or her way, and then trying to handle any conflict in a healthy way, sitting down with the customer, let me understand, can I see some photos of you from the past? How did you used to dress? What is your style? And so on and so on, to get to know the customer better and to be on the same wavelength in this context. That would have been a healthier way to deal with the abrasiveness that each sensed in each other, rather than starting the gossip trail, which ended in termination. It would also have looked better for the store, because that's why the store terminated the employee, right? Bad reputation, not the appropriate type of employee or salesperson that we need on our workforce. And so this got out of control, and really, this person wasn't looking at something on his own head. Christ says to get the log out of your own eye. He wasn't looking at himself. Had he looked at himself, where did I go wrong? What was I doing? Maybe I was saying something. Maybe I'm just, I'm not doing my best at providing the appropriate wardrobe for this person then maybe he wouldn't have flied off, flown off the handle with the text. I think back of my own mistakes that have caused conflict and then trying to redeem the relationship. The first step that's always helpful is where did I go wrong, right? Notice Matthew chapter 7, starting at verse 3. Why do you see the splinter that's in your brother's or sister's eye? but don't notice the log in your own eye. How can you say to your brother or sister, let me take that splinter out of your eye when there's a log in your eye? Let me help you with the way you're talking to people. And at the same time, I'm talking in a similar way to others, belittling or arguing or whatever, and so on and so on. When I look at myself, I see where there's room for improvement. When you look at yourself, you see where there's room for improvement, and from that begins a healthy route in reconciling. Remember the four G's of peacemaking? Glorify God, and now we're looking at get the log out of our own eyes. Where can we improve our relationship skills, communication skills, and so on? Looking at verse 5, same passage, Matthew 7. You deceive yourself. First, take the log out of your eye, and then you'll see clearly to take the splinter out of your brother's or sister's eye. So this is just a safety check. Okay, yeah, what could I have done better? That, that's a good way to, to lead in the conversation. I'm sorry for upsetting you. I know I should have been more clear. I'm working on that. Let's rewind a moment. Let me start over. This is what I really should have said. And then proceed from there. Have you tried that before? It works, doesn't it? Many times, just rewinding and going back to the, what we understand as the initial beginning of a misunderstanding or conflict and admitting, I could have done better. I'm sorry for doing that or saying that. That's taking the log out. But oftentimes, there's a dual reason why there's conflict. And then that initiates the other person to think about the log in their own eye. Yeah, that's right. I got emotional. I wasn't thinking logically. And that got out of, 
out of hand, and so I wasn't listening after that, and so on. Notice Proverbs 28, 13. Those who hide their sins won't succeed, but those who confess and give them up will receive mercy. See, when we take that log out, that's humility. See, Jesus put himself up on the logs, on the cross, and he didn't deserve it. That was humility. He was whipped and beaten and bruised for our iniquities, chastised for our mistakes. When we take the log out, we're like Christ in that we're humbling ourselves and asking for help and we're showing that we're willing to help others. We will receive mercy. These are effective peacemaking skills, taking the log out. First John chapter 1. This is the famous passage, verses 8 and 9, that talk about whether we have ongoing, if we have ongoing sin that we're rebelling against, we're rebelling against God, that's a different story. But when we make mistakes, in other words, we're not going to be perfect. We're only going to be perfect when we're transformed at the second coming. Until then, we have sin, it says. We deceive ourselves. The truth isn't in us if we say we don't have any sin. Verse 9, but if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from everything we've done wrong. So when we fall, when we realize we've got a log and we're picking on somebody's splinter, when we realize that we have our own issues with relationships and our own personal toxicity at times and we're complaining about somebody else's problems, We realize that mistake. We come to Jesus and ask for forgiveness. We go to the individual and ask for forgiveness, and we ask, let's start over. So imagine if that salesperson had done that. I understand you return items. That's your right. That's our policy. We accept them. No questions asked. But you know, when you return them six months later, that affects my budget at home, and I have children and so on. Is there something we can work out about this? Maybe I need to get to know you better so I'm selling you something you'll be happy with and so on. You see how that works? Am I clear enough in my presentation so you can understand what I'm trying to say? Maybe it's a committee meeting at work, planning the direction of the company, and things get a little heated. And then I begin to say something I shouldn't say retaliate. Uh, You probably just weren't listening. Too much time on your screen. Take your nose out of Facebook. Then you'll understand what we're talking about in this committee meeting. You can see where that's going to go bad in the workplace, right? That's my log. I need to get it out. We move on to number three in the G's of peacemaking. Gently restore. So we have tried to to level the field. I've made mistakes, but we need to address the other side of this issue. I promised to do better, and now I need to gently talk to you about this situation that I'm experiencing with you. Notice Galatians chapter 6. Brothers and sisters, if a person is caught doing something wrong, you who are spiritual should restore someone like this. So yes, this is our prerogative when we have the authority to lead someone, if it's someone under our care, someone we know, it's not about picking on someone who we don't know, a visitor or a guest, someone who is not breaking any laws, and so on. It's about in the right context. I won't go in that, into this for time, but I think you understand. I think you understand. I, I I I, uh, have lots of stories to share on that, but when we're spiritual, in the context of the church now, as Christians, we need a spirit of gentleness to know about time and place on when to gently restore someone. Yes, if someone's going around hitting and using foul language in public or here in the sanctuary, it would be, hey, let's go talk outside. It may not be the time to address the specific issue in front of everybody. Can I have a word with you? Take the person outside, deal with it, right? Can I have the room, please, if it's in a committee meeting? 
to your children. The rest of the siblings need to leave while you deal with the one child that has a behavior issue and so on. Gently. Watch out for yourselves so you won't be tempted to. So you won't be tempted as well to put a log in our eye, right? This is a prayerful technique, isn't it? Always looking to Jesus when we're dealing with this. Carry each other's burdens, and so you will fulfill the law of Christ. In other words, continue to be thoughtful and gentle, contemplative and prayerful on how and when and by what means we follow all these previous steps we've gone through. Negotiation, knowing when to decide between letting it go or addressing the issue. And when it has to be addressed, we do it gently and carefully. Ephesians 4.29, don't let any foul words come out of your mouth. Talking about arguments and having to retract things because we got angry. Only say what's helpful when it's needed for building up the community so that it benefits those who hear what you say. That's gently restoring. That text message, a Yelp review, can tend to be foul, can't it? They can go awry. The phone call to somebody who's not part of the reconciliation process. So when we go and be reconciled, we need to go to the person. We need to go to the group, the people that are actually involved in the conflict. Others that aren't part of it should never hear about it. That's the ideal because it doesn't glorify God, does it? See, Jesus talks to your heart, doesn't he? He doesn't blab it to the world when we make mistakes. When our mistakes become public, and as leaders in the church context, for instance, we address it when needed, but we do it gently. We're trying to reconcile. We're trying to help each other get stronger and be clear in our path. Notice Ephesians chapter 4. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. So we have to bear with behaviors sometimes for a bit. We have to navigate how to reconcile, when and how to stop behaviors. This is the make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Ephesians 4, 2 through 3. Be completely humble and gentle. Make every effort. This is the go and be reconciled. So let's close this up with, with a test now. There's a conflict. It can be among your family. It can be at work. It can be in the church, school. It's happened and you're not part of it. You're not even involved. In fact, you didn't even know it was happening. You didn't know that all that was happening behind the scenes. But then there was a leak. We hear a lot about leakers. And the leaker comes and begins to tell you all about this situation. The individuals involved, what they did, and he said, and she said. Or maybe it's even on social media this is being blabbed. And you are the recipient of this information. And you have this person, you have their attention. How can we respond to this? Really? Tell me more. Oh, um, let me take some notes. Is that a healthy way? A healthier way, in fact, that's an unhealthy way. A healthy way is try this. Why are you telling me this? Did you get that? It's a question. Stop it a second. Hold on, wait. Why are you telling me this? You see what that does? It reminds the person as they're venting, generally people aren't, malicious about gossip. Other times they are. Hopefully you don't know anybody like that. Many times we just make mistakes because we're venting and we forget we're venting to the wrong persons that aren't involved in the conflict and the resolution. So just asking that question as a church leader, as a member, if someone's bringing you gossip in the church or a family member, some other family member is bringing gossip or the workplace or wherever. Why are you telling me this? That helps the person remember, oh, wait a minute. Huh, yeah, you really shouldn't be hearing about this. I'm sorry. It helps them check their intentions. Why are they doing this? And then they realize, ideally, that this is bad judgment. 
to share this information. Another way to respond is, what's the difference between what you're telling me and gossip? That's a little less gentle, right? But what's the difference? So that's not inferring that they're gossiping, but do you get that one? That makes sense. What's the difference between what you're telling me and gossip? Remember, gossip, by definition, even if it's true, it doesn't have to be false, is information that sheds somebody in a poor light. It's, it's bad information. It doesn't make them look good, even if it's true. Same effect. It helps them check their understanding. Here's another way to respond if the person keeps talking. How is your telling me that thought or that complaint or that information, how is telling me this going to help you and me love God and our brother or sisters better and knit us closer together as a church in Christ's love? How is you telling me this going to help build us up? And that helps the person remember that they're leaking the information to the wrong parties. Someone who should never have known about that behavior because it didn't involve them and it was private and the right people were handling the issue. Here's another way to respond. And now that you've told me about that, what are you going to do about it? Reminding the person that they are part of the reconciliation process but that's between them and somebody else or somebody, some group and not between me as the recipient of the gossip. It's their responsibility not to run away, but to make every effort to maintain peace. Amen? So this is a reminder that they need to make a plan. Number one, not share this with anybody else again. Number two, to begin working towards steps of reconciliation. Here's a final one of many. Now that you've told me about that, you're morally obligated, you've morally obligated me to make sure you talk to this person about it. How long do you think you need? In other words, now I'm holding this person accountable, or you can. You can help them heal or gain strength and reconciliation skills by now being their, uh, their accountability partner. Okay, you share with me. I'm not going to share this with anybody else. The information's out. Now then, go and be reconciled and check back in with me later. We'll see how it goes. We'll see how you glorify God in this process. And so these are just some of the steps that together, as we use Bible apps in our lives, we've now applied these passages that Jesus has given us to help us be better peacemakers, to be stronger as peacemakers. And I encourage each of you to practice these as you are doing to maintain a healthy congregation, to maintain healthy families, work relationships, and even to maintain your rapport with the public. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for all the things that you've given us, and for this we glorify you. Continue to give us wisdom as we read Scripture and apply it. May we understand clearly what to do next, and may we agonize and be thoughtful and be gentle about anything that comes up that we're uncomfortable with because it's a conflict a misunderstanding. Guide us in relationships. May we be more like Jesus. May we be a shining example of the kingdom of heaven. Each and every day we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.